Nearly 100 days after the deadly January 6 insurrection and in the midst of a national reckoning over domestic extremism, a new report lays out the staggering scale of the threat now facing the country. From the Washington Post, quote, domestic terrorism incidents have soared to new highs in the United States, driven chiefly by white supremacist, anti-Muslim and anti-government extremists on the far right. The surge reflects a growing threat from homegrown terrorism not seen in a quarter century with right-wing extremist attacks and plots greatly eclipsing those from the far left and causing more deaths. One major plank in the federal government's efforts to tackle the threat is rooting out extremism in the military. It's an issue underscored by the fact that nearly one in six capital riot suspects are veterans. The Defense Department has announced the end of a standout period and new moves to tackle domestic extremism. But as The New York Times notes, quote, as the Pentagon on Friday presented its path forward, a working group will be set up to examine how to better vet recruits and how to better educate service members who may be targeted by extremist organizations. Senior Defense Department officials acknowledged that one thing is clear. Rooting out extremist views from a military of 1.3 million active duty troops drawn from Alaska to Florida will be an uphill slog. Joining our conversation are two U.S. Army veterans, Wes Moore, CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, and Paul Rykoff, president of Righteous Media and founder of the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. I've talked to both of you over the years, and it's been a privilege, but to have you both together to talk about this um, I'm really, I'm really needing to hear from both of you on this. Why and how does this represent the current, current state of the U.S. military? You first, Wes. Well, I, I think that one thing that we're seeing is that the military is, as it always has been, it's a, it's a microcosm of this country. Right. It's a microcosm of, of right. people from all walks of life and from all places. And the reality is, is that as we're watching this larger kick up that's taking place in the United States, where we saw that, you know, the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies shows that of the 61 terrorist plots uh, that have happened in the first eight months of the year, that 41 uh, have been white supremacist groups. Uh, and so you're seeing how the military is just simply a reflection of the type of things that we're seeing within our large society. Now, the important thing to remember, though, is that just like in times past, the military has a unique opportunity to actually be at the lead in terms of helping to change it, helping to alter it and helping to uproot it and uh, and, and change our destiny. And so that's really, I think, the important point where the, where the military can and should and will have an important role in terms of getting us as a large society to a better place on this. And I guess, Paul, I, I understand that it is a reflection of our society. The numbers are proportional, but the stakes are just so much higher. I mean, when the right wing militias, as they seem to have done, plan ahead of time to conspire to attack the United States Capitol and chant hang Mike Pence, one, they're more they're more trained in the stated objectives. And two, it just represents such a, a breach of, of, of trust in terms of the traditional relationship that most civilians feel like they have with the military. Yeah, I mean, military uh, folks and, and veterans, Nicole, are, are very powerful. And, and that power can be used to promote change. It can be somebody like Tammy Duckworth or Pete Buttigieg or even my friend Wes Moore here, who's been tackling hate and extremism uh, for, for decades. Or it can be somebody recruited by the Proud Boys. It can be Timothy McVeigh. And I think the most important thing that, that I see here is a national security strategic failure. There was a failure to recognize extremism as a national security threat by, most of all, the commander in chief of the last four decades. Trump did not help the situation. He even encouraged the situation. And that failure by the commander in chief is what we're living with now. In the same way, we failed to recognize threat after 9-11 and before 9-11, we failed to recognize that extremists could take over the Capitol. So there's been a national security failure at the leadership level and down at the Pentagon that's resulted in the situation we have right now, which presents the most urgent, most pressing, most serious national security threat we have. That's why the military is taking it so seriously. But only last year, you could fly a Confederate flag in the barracks. So, so there was a, a years and years of failures at the national level, at the Pentagon level, of recognizing extremism as a real threat. So we are fighting uphill. But we've got to take it as seriously as we did terrorism, you know, 15, 20 years ago. 
Well, and, and Wes, if you could just pick up on that. I mean, I wondered when we watched Donald Trump, um, his response to the country's sort of painful uh, racial reckoning after the killing of George Floyd was to champion Confederate monuments and complain when localities decided to take them down. What did that look like inside the, the military to have sort of a very public permission structure um, paraded out at the highest levels of our country's politics for the world to see that championed um, some of the same aims of white supremacists? And, and, and it's also what it still looks like to this day. You know, I, I think mm. about the fact that for many of the many of the bases, as Paul pointed out, for many of the bases that I was trained on, you know, when whether you're talking about places like Fort Hood or Fort Benning, Fort Bragg, the home of the 82nd Airborne Division, Fort Bragg is named after Braxton Bragg, who was not just a Confederate general, slave owner, a traitor and a coward, but also by all respects, just not a very good soldier. And that's who Fort Bragg is named after. And so we think mm -hmm. about this idea that the military still to this day, still to this day, has places and monuments where we are where we are training the future leaders, the future military leaders of this country uh, for places that were named after people who, frankly, despised me. And so that mm. is a part of this larger conversation that the military has to take its own personal measures of account for. And then if we're going to say, how do we do things to uproot hatred and how do we do things to uproot this type of, you know, this 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 type of, of, of anger in these actions, it also has to start with things like who are we celebrating and how are we putting together a real platform to be able to address some of the harms that have happened for so long that people just did not put enough thought into? This may be too granular to get done here. And if it is, I hope I can ask both of you to come back early and often. But I, I want to ask both of you about right wing media and their influence on um, either, you know, again, emboldening sort of the, the racist or um, intolerant views of, of what is just a reflection, I guess, of what is in our society at this hour, at this moment, at this time. And how much of that is sort of cheered? I mean, is there a propaganda problem? I read that 40 percent of, I think, Marines don't want to get the COVID vaccine. Um, you see this rise of extremism. I mean, what what is the role of right wing media in sort of spreading and fomenting some of those views, Paul? It's critical. I think if we recognize that this, this has many elements of a domestic insurgency, right? And I think that's what it is. It has, it has many elements of a domestic insurgency. How do you combat an insurgent? You can't arrest and kill all of them, right? You have to try to attack the power structures at the top. And I think the most effective thing we did was vote Donald Trump out. That sent a clear message, and that's now oh. reverberating down to who he's chosen as Secretary of Defense, the first African-American Secretary of Defense, the policies that are changing inclusivity to include women and LGBTQ people. We're changing the power structures and the messaging at the top, and that includes conservative media. We have to fight misinformation with good information, but you have to go down to the grassroots, too. In the same way you couldn't kill all the insurgents in Iraq, you can't lock up every extremist in America. So you have to provide them with opportunities and alternatives. And that usually means jobs right. and a way toward the future. And that's where I think, as an example, President Biden's infrastructure plan could actually help. If you give people jobs, opportunities, a role in the future in red states that are resistant, that don't want to take the COVID vaccine, that's much more effective in combating extremism than trying to lock them all up, because you'll never get there. You have to change the hearts and minds. And that starts at the top, but it also has to happen at the bottom. What did you both feel when, I mean, when you watched the insurrection on TV, was it apparent to you that such large numbers of the participants were, I mean, a disproportionate number of, of the people who have been charged? Or I think I have the exact number. Um, well, in general, 6.4 percent of the plots and attacks committed by active duty reserve personnel in 2020, up from 1.5 in 20. 19 veterans and active duty members make up 25 percent of militia membership. Um, and then the flip side that you both address is that the government and military are the target of 38 percent of the attacks, but specifically on the Capitol riot. Um, Wes, did you watch it and, and wonder how many members that were there as, as uh, parts of the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys were former military or was it obvious to you? 
It was um, that day was 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 heartbreaking, but not terribly surprising. Uh, you know, we, 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 we know that you look at a situation like that, that, you know, that has never happened before, not even during, not even during the Civil War did we watch that. Yet at the same time, when you watched everything from tactics to badges that people had on there, you saw that this was a larger problem that was incorporating, you know, the, the, the people who Paul and I very proudly, you know, part of a unit that the units that Paul and I very proudly serve with. But these were members of the very same units. And so mm -hmm. this is becoming something that when I when we think about what is the the what are the things that we have to incorporate as we are incorporating tactics and and uh, and practices within our within the service as we're putting together things from you know how to put together an operational model to how to put together a strategic plan on on uh, on commencing with a mission we also have to focus on things that others might be missing when it comes to the levels of primary education how do we have a, a more inclusive mm -hmm. service? How do we focus on things like history so people can understand real history of this country? How do we focus on humanizing the people to your left and to your right? Because without that element, if we are just relying on people and taking them as we see them without understanding the military's role in this as well, then we will continue seeing the type of numbers and stats that showed themselves on January 6th and beyond. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.